sore throat. Rather than endure such discomfort, they are simply put to sleep. You mean they are put to sleep while they have a cold or that they're murdered? Calvin demanded. Murder is a most primitive word, Charles Wallace said. There is no such thing as murder on Kamazots. It takes care of all such things. He moved jerkily to the wall of the corridor, stood still for a moment, then raised his hand. The wall flickered, quivered, grew transparent. Charles Wallace walked through it, beckoned to Meg and Calvin, and they followed. They were in a small square room from which radiated a dull, sulfurous light. There was something ominous to Meg in the very compactness of the room, as though the walls, the ceiling, the floor might move together and crush anybody rash enough to enter. How did you do that? Calvin asked Charles. Do what? Make the wall open like that. I merely rearranged the atoms, Charles Wallace said loftily. You've studied atoms in school, haven't you? Sure, but then you know enough to know that matter isn't solid, don't you? That you, Calvin, consists mostly of empty space. That if all the matter in you came together, you'd be the size of the head of a pen. That's plain scientific fact, isn't it? Yes, but so I simply push the atoms aside and we walk through the space between them. Meg's stomach seemed to drop as she realized that the square box in which they stood must be an elevator and that they had started to move upward with great speed. The yellow light lit up their faces and the pale blue of Charles' eyes absorbed the yellow and turned green. Calvin licked his lips. Where are we going? Up, Charles continued his lecture. On Kamazats, we are all happy because we are all alike. Differences create problems. You know that, don't you, dear sister? No, Meg said. Oh, yes, you do. You've seen at home how true it is. You know that the reason, that's the reason you're not happy at school, because you're different. I'm different and I'm happy, Calvin said, but you pretend that you aren't different. I'm different and I like being different. Calvin's voice was unnaturally loud. Maybe I don't like being different, Meg said, but I don't want to be like everybody else either. Charles Wallace raised his hand and the motion of the square box ceased and one of the walls seemed to disappear. Charles stepped out, Meg and Calvin following him. Calvin just barely making it before the wall came into being again and they could no longer see where the opening had been. You wanted Calvin to get left behind, didn't you, Meg said. I am merely trying to teach you to stay on your toes. I warn you, if I have any more trouble from either of you, I shall have to take you to it. As the word it fell from Charles' lips, again Meg felt as though she had been touched by something slimy and horrible. So what is this it, she asked. You might call it it, sorry, you might call it the boss. Then Charles Wallace giggled a giggle that was the most sinister sound Meg had ever heard. It sometimes calls, it sometimes calls itself the happiest sadist. Meg spoke coldly to cover her fear. I don't know what you're talking about. That's S-A-D-I-S-T, not S-A-D-D-E-S-T, you know? Charles Wallace said and giggled again. Lots of people don't pronounce it correctly. Well, I don't care, Meg said defiantly. I don't ever want to see it and that's that. Charles Wallace's strange monotonous voice ground against his ear, her ears. Meg, you're supposed to have some mind. Why don't you think we have wars at home? Why do you think people get confused and unhappy? because they all live their own separate individual lives. I've been trying to explain to you in the simplest possible way that on Kamazots, individuals have been done away with. Kamazots is one mind, it's it. And that's why everybody's so happy and efficient. That's what old witches like Mrs. What's It don't want to have happen at home. She's not a witch, Meg interrupted. No, no, Calvin said. You know she's not. 
you know that's just their game, their way, maybe of laughing in the dark. Okay, so there's that laughing in the dark thing again. Um, and it's interesting because there's a lot of things that Charles Wallace is saying that you know it's not Charles Wallace and doing. He's walking around having the walls move in front of them. He's controlling everything. He's never, we know Charles Wallace has never been there before. So we definitely can pick up the fact that he's being hypnotized, controlled by someone else. But it seems like Calvin and Meg keep arguing with him about things like whether, you know, Mrs. What's It is a real witch or not, which they know Charles Wallace knows she's not. But anyway, let's continue. Um, where were we here? Okay, um, you know she's not. You know that's just their game, the, their way, maybe of laughing in the dark or whistling in the dark was the other phrase. In the dark is correct, Charles continued. They want us to go on being confused instead of properly organized. Meg shook her head violently. No, she shouted. I know our world is, isn't perfect, Charles, but it's better than this. This isn't the only alternative. It can't be. Nobody suffers here, Charles intoned. Nobody's ever unhappy. But nobody's ever happy either, Meg said earnestly. Maybe if you aren't unhappy, sometimes you don't know how to be happy. Calvin, I want to go home. We can't leave, Charles, Calvin told her. And we can't go before we found your father. You know that. But you're right, Meg. And Mrs. Witch is right. This is evil. Charles Wallace shook his head. And scorn and disapproval seemed to emanate from him. Come, we're wasting time. He moved rapidly down the corridor, but continued to speak. How dreadful it is to be low individual organism. His pace quickened from step to step, his short legs flashing so that Meg and Calvin almost had to run to keep up with him. Now see this, he said. He raised his hand and suddenly they could see through one of the walls into a small room. In the room, a little boy was bouncing a ball. He was bouncing it in rhythm, and the walls of his little cell seemed to pulse with the rhythm of the ball. And each time the ball bounced, he screamed as though he were in pain. That's the little boy we saw this afternoon, Calvin said sharply. The little boy who wasn't bouncing the ball like the others. Charles Wallace giggled again. Yes, every once in a while, there's a little trouble with cooperation but it's easily taken care of. After today, he'll never desire to deviate again. Ah, uh, here we are. He moved rapidly down the corridor and again held up his hand to make the wall transparent. They looked into another small room or cell. In the center of it was a large, round, transparent column. And inside this column was a man. Father, Meg screamed. Okay, so that's the end of chapter eight. It was a short one. And the title of it um, was Transparent Column, I believe. And the very last sentence or last couple of sentences, we found out why it was titled that. That is where they finally find Meg and Charles Wallace's father. Okay, thank you so much for, for joining Shelby and me while we read today. And we look forward to seeing you next time.